Good afternoon. My name is Joe Vandal. Welcome to Deadly Days, Tales of Dark Fantasy. Uh, every week we have a story for you. I, these are stories that I have translated from the German. Um, and I publish them as books. So if you're interested in the books, they're you can go to lulu.com, lulu is l-u-l-u dot com, and you can look up for my name, Joe Bandel, band like a rock and roll band, E-L, Bandel, or you can go directly to my spotlight page, which is lulu.com slash spotlight slash anarchist banjo. Now, I draw these stories from pretty much four sources right now. There's going to be more as, as I get more uh, authors in. But the main authors that you're going to be hearing or the sources that I have are uh, Hans Heinz Ewers and Carl Hans Strobel, who were two of the greatest uh, horror writers in Germany at the, in the, during the turn of the century. I also draw stories from Der Orchidean Garten, which was the world's first fantasy mag, illustrated fantasy magazine, and from a magazine called Cocaine, which I translated for Side Real Press. It was a limited edition and sold out within three weeks, my understanding. I'm also, this fall, I'm going to be putting a lot of these stories up as ebooks on Kindles. Some of them are already on Kindle, the books are. So if you are interested in, in that, of course, uh, that's always a good option. Uh, it's cheaper than uh, paperbacks or hardcover books. Okay. That pretty much covers that. Today's story is going to be kind of a strange story. And I, I struggle with, with some of the words here. The title of this is Anthropo-Overopartis. Overo so that's a tongue twister. Anyway, this is... Ewer's sense of humor. Let's see if you think it's funny or not. A word pro domo for the professional and the amateur. The second December issue of the London Medical Review contained the entire short notice. It found its way into all the newspapers of the world. The two Edinburgh doctors, Professor Paid Scuttle and Dr. Feesmup, after long exper experimentation and several attempts, had finally invented the anthropo ovaropartis. It would take the egg from a human female and grow it in accordance with nature. This technology would be suitable to bring about an eerie change in the life of mankind. Both gentlemen were carefully guarding the secret for the present, but it stood to hope that it wouldn't be long until a public announcement would be made. I was looking over this interesting announcement, and a compelling urge came over me to publicly explain the truth, that the idea of the anthropo ovaropartis, a machine that would grow the eggs of the human female, belonged to me, and they should have talked to me first. Unfortunately, I had been such an ass that instead of a patent, I only had a pattern for protection. For the sake of my fatherland and for myself, I wanted to see this eerie machine that grew human eggs in accordance with nature and determine if I had been robbed. I wanted to know if the materialization of my thought had been obtained. At least I will preserve the glory for each of us. Both Scottish scholars likely put down everything about their invention of the anthropo 
over Opartus, so there could be no dispute over that. I am compelled to name unique witnesses that can prove my side of the story. They are Superintendent of Public Schools, Dr. Schultz of Kopenick, and the foreign maiden, Frida Noller. Current whereabouts unknown by the police. On the night of 4 to 5 November 1903, I traveled with the superintendent for three hours through the early morning down Friedrich Street. On the corner of Orienberger Street, we met up with Frau Noller, whom he wanted to strike up an acquaintance with. I had felt the need to bring these two different people together as matchmaker in an unceremonious way to see if they would like each other. I observed explicitly a possible annoyance and unpleasantness in the air and didn't push it. On the contrary, I felt compelled to pay for some food and drink. I find that subtlety is a precondition of law when you can't get what you want. You can gather from this that I am as good a lawyer as a distinguished physician, which gives my discovery certain characteristics of both. At 117 Friedrich Street, I entered the pub Hulking Hound. With them, for the, with them for the aforesaid purpose of warming the pair up a bit toward each other. I can say that Superintendent Dr. Schultz went out of his way to be pleasant, while Frau Noller showed a remarkable dislike toward him in her behavior. In her opposition, she was determined to break the lively and vivacious spirit of the pedagogue. I ordered a quantity of stimulating beverages in the hopes that it would lighten things up a bit, and we gradually became engrossed in deeper, more scholarly questions. Frau Noller had read in Minnehaha of the fetal movements of the unborn child and its transformation. She wanted to know from the educated superintendent if there was a solution to the female question wherein some steps could be taken in consideration of the financially distressed farmer and the academic youth to make their lives easier. We talked all around this subject of pregnancy and always kept coming back to the main point of inadequate health care. The superintendent finally said in conclusion, the only way the egg could get the nourishment it needed was through its connection to the mother's womb. I would like to say in that moment as he spoke this fateful sentence, a hundred words that had up till now only been phrases to me became palpable reality. I recognized the symbol in the painting from Sias, and it ripped the veil from my eyes. I held the philosopher's stone in my hand. I had laid the egg of Columbus. I sighed deeply three times and felt that in a single second I had found the solution to the social question and everything else. Then the superintendent, to whom I was indebted, raised his hand, but I pressed it back down and ordered the seventeenth round of grog. While the beverage was being brought, I calmed myself a bit, while another wretched witness, taxi driver second class number 7468, came up and sat at a nearby table. I stood up, looked at my watch, and gave the following speech. You will want to note this moment well, ladies and gentlemen. It marks a revolution in the unseemly life history of humanity that we have up to now seen. It is now precisely four hours and 19 minutes. Furthermore, you will want to consider my person and impress upon your memory that in this moment the man stands before you that can bring the greatest victory to mankind if you will let him continue. You, Miss Noller, only snore. Would you give more special attention to my words if you knew the destiny you have been given to sit here as a singular representative of your sex 
and that through me you will strike a blow that will raise up and advance civilization a hundred thousand years? We have been talking about the female question. Why is it that in the war with the male, the female always appears to take the weaker part? We all know it is your sexual occupation. It is a fact that the female must carry and then bear children. And if that is not the case, must otherwise regularly suffer in a disagreeable manner, a reminder from nature of her femininity. We want to apply some lever and find a solution that will lessen the severity of your periods. From my point of view, pregnancy and childbirth in this modern setting now appear thoroughly inadequate and obsolete. We have a moral obligation. You, Superintendent, should especially honor this time. It is sad that men forbid pregnant women who are willing to produce new sons for the fatherland to set foot on the street. Almost daily we see women and virgins wandering around in most inappropriate circumstances. I ask you, what impression does this make on the innocent maid that is growing up? The innocent child wonders. She questions, where did I come from? She goes for days experiencing things she should never experience. This is so far from hygienic. I ask, is this condition healthy for women? Simply no, it is not. All suffer down there, some more, some less, but it is acceptable to none. Then there is the birth. The labor is very intense and many women even collapse from the pain. Aesthetically speaking, the time of pregnancy that paints a fat woman, every woman is now over, thank God. The newborn is equally as ugly and goes contrary to our perception of beauty. I am speaking out of an experience with my girlfriend, Miss Needlich. I told her the baby looked like a noisome scarlet Aztec frog, but the mother found her child very beautiful. This is a certain sign that childbearing undermines the aesthetic experience. If I need to give any more proof, I can point to the frightful and horrifying state of modern medicine. It is unworthy and adverse to childbirth and to civilization. Now, I personally don't have anything against this manner of childbirth. In general, it is worthy, serves to propagate the human race, and normally I wouldn't say a word against it. Unfortunately, my fellow men have spoken many words about it, because they are asses. So I won't stay quiet either about the facts of perpetual childbearing and how the female could be improved from the ground up and not have to endure so much. My dear superintendent, you said, the only way the egg could get the nourishment it needed is through its connection to the mother's womb. You have no idea what these words have given to humanity. Yes, we could separate the womb of this woman of the future from the exemplary egg that she carries. We could give her back her womb, and from now on, if this was done, our women could lay eggs. We are only mortal humans and can't transform into a swan like Jupiter, and our women can't lay eggs. For the singer in the myth, this is only a slight difficulty because a God finds the solution. Today, we are capable of finding this solution for ourselves. Where can we find this knowledge? Let us consider our predecessor, the hen that, hen that lays eggs with shells. It holds the missing piece in which the egg is grown in its womb, and then with the nourishment of lime grows a shell around it and finally passes the entire egg through its body. In women, sadly, this egg is nourished through the connection to the womb along with its contractions and discomfort. This connection must be severed in an alternate way of nourishing the egg manufactured and put into place. 
this could be something along the lines of the successful Uterenterostami performed at Harvard University by Professor Babywater, but in a different new direction with continued success. You could reconnect the umbilical cord to a new source of nourishment and give the fetus what it needs for the best health and growing bones. Perhaps if we made an entire generation of youth through this operation, they would later acquire the hereditary ability to lay eggs and being male or female would not be as important anymore. If that is not the case, and I personally doubt very much if it would be, then we could soon be enlightened enough to make the small infringement of an operation and clip the small boys, making them into females as well. Our pregnant women could then take, would then need to take lots of lime and phosphorus in order to produce, to produce the important eggshell and through therapy or mechanical means bring about the momentary contractions that must be applied to bring about the quick laying of the egg. Perhaps later this would not be needed anymore, and our great-granddaughters could lay eggs as nice and pretty as the best hen. The famous poultry breeder Poulain d'Or in Cambrai found a process to enlarge the ovaries and fortify their propagation through the application of the Yohimbin speculum on the one hand, along with radium treatments on the other, with amazing success in the increase of life energy and reproductive growth. If it had been done with our women instead, they would have not once a month, but every day, and especially adept women twice a day, effortlessly laid a magnificent egg like the greatest swan. We only think of enriching our future national health by nourishing it on a daily basis. In Germany, we have around 20 million women between 15 and 45 years of age. They could comfortably lay 25 million eggs every day that would supplement our national need for more workers. That is precisely what is needed for our national prosperity, along with the deepening of our economy and consumption of more products. Everyone could hatch a fertilized eggs in an ovario embryo pedo nursery that would ensure the good simple connection every egg in our day requires. The betterment of the race also grows in my consideration. Through the process of natural selection, we could take eggs only from select exemplary, especially beautiful, powerful, healthy, and clever women. We could avoid eggs from weak, sick, dumb, and ugly women and not let them hatch. My idea could easily answer and bring clarity to half a dozen other questions that exist around the world today, like the need to support the fragile head of the infant when you hold it, or the social question. Socialist democratic eggs simply would not be hatched. Only liberal eggs on a very limited scale. The Polish question, the Jewish question, the gypsy question, the anti-military question. Polish, Jewish, gypsy, anti-military eggs would not be hatched. For America, the Negro question, the Chinese question, the Japanese question. Negro, Chinese, and Japanese eggs would not be hatched. The Balkan question that is coming here, the one that gets people so worked up that they throw each other around. In every village is a landscape or a different populace. In one district, only Bulgarians. In another, only Greeks. And in another, only Turkish eggs would be hatched. In a single generation, everything would be in better order the Balkan question would be resolved. The criminal question, the religious question. Criminals, atheists, and monists are simply not hatched. It would certainly be best if only good Catholic eggs were allowed to hatch. And yes, the free artists with their obscenities and rubbish and word and picture that so infest the world could now be cleansed as well. 
eggs of upstanding thinkers, musicians, painters, and poets, and of any connected with them would under no circumstances be permitted to hatch. In this way, the coming generation could remove the arts entirely and link the world in good patriotic pathways. But if the good citizen would certify or prove his good character to the egg hatchery, his wife would be allowed to produce a beautiful egg. If she couldn't lay an especially beautiful one, or even more, an even more splendid one could be given to him, or he could buy one and write his name on it before it is placed in its glass case in the distinguished nest at the hatchery. If he was especially interested, he could go there now and then to take a peep at it, particularly during the fourth quarter when the little fellow bursts out of his shell. It would certainly be amusing. Otherwise, two years later, he could come back as a daddy and fetch him for the first time from the clean room at the Overo Embryo Pedo Nursery, where the child has been kept. The entire indecency of today's childbirth would be avoided. The aesthetic would have triumphed as well as the moral. The, the female question would be resolved as well with the wife being perfectly equal to the husband. Her body would once more belong to her and not be disturbed by the little bit of egg laying required. On the contrary, she would be given an even greater asset to her she would become an even greater asset to her husband because an egg or two is always worth something even more in this manner as soon as i reached this point i realized that strange gurgling noises were coming from superintendent d schultz dr schultz and unpleasantly mixing with the soft snores of Frau Knoller. In the meantime, cab driver second class number 7468 had caught up with us, polished off 18 rounds of grog during my speech, and was now sleeping. I woke him up and reproached him for his negligence but reconciled later and drank schmollis with him. He then took it upon himself to take me back home and bring me to bed. We left my friend, Superintendent Dr. Schultz of Kopenick, in the keeping of Frau Noller. What happened to him after that, I have no idea. So, those are the simple facts. They are the only witnesses that can prove my part in the creation of the anthropo -oropartis. Their statements would naturally be very valuable to me in establishing my rights. Sadly, I can only guess at the rest and can't prove any of it. All I know is the police don't know the present whereabouts of Frau Noller. They have both been gone from Berlin for two years now, and it's likely they ended up in London. I am convinced they made the acquaintance of Professor Paid Scuttle or Dr. Feesmup in Piccadilly, and these two gentlemen treacherously made off with my idea of the anthropo overopartis. These sons of Scotland may get all the coin, but nevertheless, the great thought the great idea of producing a pure and superior German youth still belongs to me. And that's the end of that story. Kind of sounds like today's modern world in a way. I better shut up. Okay, till next time.